ESP. Investigate with us. Case 1. Hélène Jagardeau. December the 6th, 1851, Rennes in Brittany. A trial opens in France dealing with tumultuous times. The accused, Hélène Jagardeau, according to the prosecution, she poisoned several people using arsenic. The number of victims she targeted or killed compounds the ignominy of her crimes. Due to the prescription, the indictment only covers three murders three attempted murders and 11 thefts. Her murderous intents left no one safe. Employers, servants, children, even an aunt and a sister became her victims. Ten years ago, Marie Lafarge, the inspiration for Flaubert's Madame Bovary, was imprisoned for the murder of her husband. Since mentions of arsenic and poisoning in the same sentence can only raise the curiosity of a public looking for thrills. A servant with access to the home and intimacy of families she destroys from within should attract large crowds and a swarm of journalists eager for headlines spelling out the gory details. However, this did not happen. The public attention focused on what was happening in Paris at the time. The capital is in a state of siege after the coup d'etat on the 2nd of December 1851. The president, Louis-Napoleon Bonaparte, has announced the end of the Republic and is on his way to become Napoleon III. Some citizens have reacted with anger and riots have broken out all over France. The trial of Hélène Jagardeau itself had not been impacted. One expert witness for the defence died on a barricade before testifying. The dramatic events taking place in Paris overshadowed the trial. It could explain why her crimes did not generate as much interest as Marie Lafarge's. After her death, Hélène gained some notoriety in Brittany as a bogeywoman, used to terrify children to behave. The National Museum of Brittany keeps her death mask and a copy of a ballad describing her crimes. The woman keeps her mystery. She left no personal writing. The trial's transcript reports of her few interactions with the prosecution. She made a confession the night before her execution, which was between the 25th and the 26th of February, 1852. And she asked that it should be leaked to the public. We can't even rely on this as a truth, as there is no way to know the words are truly hers, and not those of a man trying to edify the public. The authorities investigated Hélène's claims and dismissed some, labelling them as total fabrication. The prosecution described Hélène Jagardeau as a soulless monster, prying and killing innocent souls. They portray her as an immoral wench who, under the mask of piety, would go gavotting with soldiers. The witnesses paint Hélène as a creature always getting into conflict with her employers or co-workers. The accusation and experts, to explain her string of crimes, conclude that Hélène is a freak of nature, a perverse beast with no redeeming traits. They misjudge the complexity of Hélène's story. No crime exists in a vacuum, and any action causes a reaction. Her chaotic existence fostered dark forces, leading Hélène to the guillotine. She committed numerous crimes in reaction to the world and environment surrounding her. When applied to Hélène, the proverb, the child who is not embraced by the village will burn it down to feel its warmth, rings true. At the time of the trial, Hélène is 48 years old, unmarried, illiterate and very poor. All her life she worked as a servant and a cook. She speaks French with a strong local accent and peppers her sentences with Breton idioms. To understand her crimes, 
we must first uncover her past. The few drawings we have show a small woman, old, ugly and curbing under the weight of years. Born in 1803 from poor peasants, Hélène loses her parents. At just seven years old, her childhood ends. She is sent to a presbytery and starts to work as a maid, learning to cook and clean. Being sent to work at such a young age was not unusual in a world in which uneducated women had limited expectations. We have no information about how her youngest years were. We can only imagine the gruelling existence and the struggle to make it through as a young servant girl. Then, in 1833, when she is 30 years old, everything changes and the life of Hélène takes a dark turn. At that time, King Cholera was sweeping through Europe and by 1832, Brittany suffered several outbreaks. During this period, Hélène works at Gurn, a small village employed by Mr. Ladrogo, a priest. Then, disaster strikes. Between the 28th of June and the 3rd of October 1833, seven people died in the household. The priest, his parents, his niece, two farm workers and Anna, Hélène Jagardot's visiting sister. During these tragic times, Hélène takes care of the sick people, running herself ragged all around the clock, so much so that she becomes ill herself. By the 3rd of October, we are told that Hélène is the only one left alive. She does not stay unemployed for too long. The death of her sister left an opening in the household of the priest of Boubry, which she filled. But then again, people died, three this time, Hélène's own aunt and the priest's niece and sister. So, she goes to live with Mrs. Labouche to work and learn the trade of a laundress. Mrs. Labouche's mother and sister died. Her brother fell sick too. His refusal to eat what Hélène prepared probably saved his life. In six months, 12 people died when Hélène was in the vicinity. From 1834 to 1851, Hélène hops from house to house. Each time people get sick where she works and at least 16 deaths are recorded. She steals, quarrels with her employers and co-workers. She gains the reputation of a Jonah. Her social image suffers from her behaviour. Employers and other servants dislike Hélène because of her ill-mannered attitude, thieving, intemperance and lack of virtue. The other servants describe her as unfriendly, dirty and prone to angry outbursts. The last leg of her odyssey leads her to Wren, where she meets her fate. At this point in her life, Hélène is keen to find a place where she can enjoy steady employment. Her final employer is Théophile Bedard de la Noy, a lawyer. He also teaches law and acts as an expert during criminal trials. He soon notices that something is not right with his cook. Hélène immediately clashes with Rose Tessier, the housemaid and Bedard's right-hand woman. Hélène persists to argue with her colleague and by some stroke of good luck, Rose gets sick and dies just four days later. Hélène had been working for Bedard's house for one month. She pressed Bedard not to recruit another servant, confident she would fulfil the required duties herself. But Bedard recruits Françoise Hurio as a maid, ignoring Hélène's suggestion. At first, both women work well together, but slowly, Hélène's attitude changes. She bullies the youngest woman, slandering her to all who will listen. And then, just like Rose, Francois got sick. Luckily, she decided to go to the hospital to seek treatment, and because of her quick departure, she survived. This time as a replacement, Hélène recommends a 19-year-old girl, 
Rosalie Sarazan. They start out as friends, but the relationship turns sour pretty quickly. Bedar notices that Rosalie knows how to write and read, and so he asks her to keep the household accounts. This angers Hélène, who believes herself to be a more senior employee because of her age and her length of service in the house. The situation between the two women got so bad that on the 10th of June 1851, Bedard finally gives Hélène her two weeks notice. The very same day, Rosalie gets sick. And she died just weeks later on the 1st of July. By then, the sudden illnesses and deaths raised suspicions of the two doctors who took care of the three women. Hélène's erratic behaviour and reports of strange occurrences caused the men to doubt the death of the two maids and the ill health of the third as being mere coincidences. On their own initiative, they approach the prosecutor. The three men visit Bedard to inform him of their suspicions. And when they tell him of the situation, Hélène, who is present, suddenly shouts out, I am innocent! Despite her protest, on the day that Rosalie dies, Hélène is arrested on suspicion of murder. What makes this case so interesting? Well, Hélène is described by some as the first French female serial killer. There is no clear number for her victims. An estimation puts them between 26 to 36, across two separate time periods, that's 1833 to 1841, and then 1851. Others quote 67 deaths, or even up to 100. Her nickname, Brittany's Bronvillier, reflects her favourite modus operandi. Looking closer, she displays all the characteristics of a female serial killer. For this type of criminal, greed, rather than sexual gratification, drives the murder. That's money and social betterment, rather than sex. For each murder, for each theft, Hélène earned something that she perceived as valuable. Clothes, bed linen, gaining secure employment, avoiding expected dismissal, enjoying the sympathy from others. Female serial killers tend to kill people that they are familiar with. Hélène strikes her relatives, her employers, their families and co-workers. At first, nobody would suspect such a devoted servant would commit such a horrible act. Contrary to this, male serial killers target strangers. Male serial killers use brute force violence. On the other hand, female ones, and women in general, are more low-key, and by consequence, poisoning offers a lesser chance of detection. As a humble servant, Hélène can go as she pleases everywhere in the house. She prepares the food, gives medicine, empties chamber pots, and cleans up vomit. She is an essential member of the staff, and she has learned to make herself useful over the decades of menial work. She can tamper with food and medicine, remove proof, diverting suspicions by appearing devoted and caring. Arsenic, her weapon of choice, was widely available and copied the symptoms of cholera which was endemic at the time. Some of the murders got labelled as death by cholera and several victims suffered pre-existing diseases making their deaths less suspicious. Hélène had easy access to arsenic. While the distribution was regulated and employers needed to give their authorization to purchase it, she confirmed in her written confession that she acquired a supply. To fight an infestation of rats, it was required for each household to have a stock of arsenic. Without excusing her actions, Facts and clues explain why Hélène resorted to poisoning, murder and theft. You should remember that these crimes she committed would drive her to the guillotine, so they would not have been decided upon lightly. During her trial, Dr Pitois, a proponent of phrenology, 
states that Hélène has developed the organs of cunning, theft, murder. She has the instinct of murder. She needs to kill. She has the instinct of theft. She needs to steal. Since then, advances in science have long debunked phrenology and the making of a murderer no longer depends on the number of bumps on their skull. So, how did a seven-year-old orphaned peasant girl shape into a serial killer? Being a female servant in the 1800s required a lot of work and energy. The opening sentence of the Manual Complete de Domestique, Complete Guide for Servants, from 1836 sets the tone. Servants are commonly regarded as an unfortunate necessity. At this period in history, two categories of servants exist. Those part of a small army taking care of the big houses, working for the family for long years, and those more numerous, more fluid servants who, like Hélène, would go from home to home hoping to gain a better salary and a more stable existence, possibly becoming a permanent fixture and starting a career. Employing a maid or servant sent the right signal. Back then, some of the households made sacrifices just to hire a servant and be seen by society as upper class. It explains why some ladies of the house kept a close eye on their money or belongings, walking a precarious tightrope of extravagance and debt. Any missing items would easily raise suspicion. The lowly servant was stuck at the bottom of the household order, depending on the skills and competences they had gained through their experience. In some houses, Hélène worked as a cook and as a maid. Sometimes she was supervised by other female servants. She worked in many positions, and whilst working as a cook for Mr. Roussel, the owner of an inn called The End of the World, she was also preparing rooms for the guests. Having a servant was a sign of social prestige and proof that you belonged to the ascending bourgeoisie. While in a large house, the tasks can be shared by dozens of servants, in the smaller households, the tasks will fall on just one or two people who are expected to play all the roles perfectly or risk being dismissed. As a servant, you will be getting up early, lighting the fires in all the rooms, preparing the breakfast, carrying water from the well or pump, bringing wood and coal from the separate stores to the main house, washing the clothes by hand, sweeping, cleaning rooms and floors, doing the cooking for all other meals and catering for visitors, ironing, dusting. There is always something to do and it usually involves physical labor. Moments of rest are few and far between. For example, the guide advised that the female servant could use her periods of rest to do sewing for her employers. So it's not a surprise then that these women suffered from exhaustion, depression, and even tuberculosis caused by living in small, unaired dwellings among other infected staff. Working as a servant meant long hours, always being available when the master or mistress of the house needed any help. The servant was the first up in the house and the last to go to bed. Even during sleep, you would be mentally ticking off the list of tasks and praying that you had not forgotten to prepare your role for the following day. In 1851, when Hélène worked for her final master, Mr. Bedard, he employed two women at the time. This was not a large house and so the servants were expected to take on multiple roles. Adding to the pressure, were the expectations laid on those women. Loyalty, zeal, discretion, honesty. After all, Bedar, like any employer, expected his servants to be impeccable, which in turn would reflect on his reputation as a lawyer. Hélène's life was spent under the watchful eye of employers and other servants. No matter what their rank, they would be observing her behaviour and reporting on her. Even going outside to do errands was often frowned upon for female servants. In the Manual de Domestique, the author despairs of his habit as it suggested that the women use their outside time to meet and gossip. This piece of historical judgment can be seen in today's society 
when people are accused of gossiping like two washerwomen. Servants are instructed that they need to be clean, washing their hands frequently, ironing their own clothes before going to a church service and so on. Imagine having no free time and after cleaning and caring for other people all day, you still have to hold yourself to their high standards just so that you can leave the house and create a good reflection on your employer. The work was tiring and unfulfilling. Servant salaries depended on the revenue of the household they served in, so it's not surprising that they tended to go where their earnings were better. In general, being a servant meant that for a fairly short period, a young girl would leave her family. She would go and work as a servant to earn a living for herself and her relatives. Importantly, she would get the skills she would need later as a housewife and mother. Unfortunately, this life journey was more often than not unrealised, and servants would remain stuck in a perpetual search for the next best job, especially if they were illiterate and unmarried. The lack of privacy for a servant is permanent. Any suspicion of wrongdoing and the employer will search their room and belongings. Just one word from a colleague or a member of the family and your world could be turned upside down. Even if it was just a malicious lie with no basis. In effect, you were in bondage. You were forced by circumstance to be housed and fed by another person with no property of your own and your reputation in their hands. There was also no opportunity for education, meaning that unless you found a trustworthy friend to assist you and share their knowledge, you had a total dependence to your employer. Servants also needed to keep a book recording their periods of work, addresses and responsibilities within a household, using it as a work certificate and reference for future employment. Not presenting a satisfactory workbook meant no employment. In this age, there were rarely duplicates made, and so moving from place to place, if your book was damaged or lost, it meant years of work experience destroyed. Such a fraught existence impacted the mental and physical health of many servants, male and female. Yet, they had no choice but to work or starve. Ellen tried to learn other skills to allow her to escape this itinerant existence, but to no avail. She tried her hand working for a laundry as a maid to learn the trade. It would have been a step up, meaning a steady income and a stable place, if only Ellen had proved capable. She often lost her position in a household due to lack of available work, ironically caused by the death of her victims. As an attempt to better herself, she even once tried to join a religious community, but she was expelled because at the time she was too old and unable to read or write. This illiteracy was an unfortunate byproduct of being born into poverty and losing her parents at such an early age. If the driving force behind Hélène Jagardot's poisoning sprees was personal gain, her motives were certainly not simple. While not defending what she has done, it is easy to understand why she resorted to such extremes. As we previously mentioned, the penalty for her actions was death by guillotine. So why risk carrying out multiple crimes? In 1851, the year of her last murders, she was a poor, unmarried, illiterate servant moving from house to house. She had been working as a servant for 41 years. That's four decades. We don't know much about her childhood, but one can only imagine that losing her parents and being sent to work as a child caused a form of mental trauma. Based on modern knowledge in psychiatry and psychology, we can presume that the lack of a moral compass that her parents would have provided might be a reasonable explanation for some of her actions. Without parental discipline and guidance, living in a strange new home, having to work long exhausting hours away from her friends, 
these circumstances must have affected her. Being the youngest servant, and consequently at the bottom of the picking order, will have created opportunities for any kind of abuse and bullying vested on the young child. Imagine the cruelty of children in a playground, mercilessly picking on the less fortunate. She could not read or write, she had no parents, and her aunt was also in servitude. Hélène had no family support to fall back on. If she ran away from her job as a servant, she would have been homeless. We can presume that since 1833, her 30th year, she failed to secure a steady place of employment. For example, in one year, she lived in at least four houses. We witness a pattern that had probably been created by her unstable childhood. She slowly gained a poor reputation among servants and employers for her fiery temper, and within towns, gossip spreads easily. Even if initially she was not committing acts of indecency or partaking in immoral behaviour, one quiet word from a respected servant to her master and Hélène's reputation would be ruined. Some of her potential employers heard about her attitude during supper among members of the bourgeoisie and they learned about her poor reputation. For us looking back at this case, the startling fact is that even with this bad reputation, she keeps finding work. Taking into account the cholera outbreak and the mortality rate in France in the 1800s, this can explain a scarcity of serving staff due to a high turnover, meaning that with her life experience as a servant, Hélène was still needed despite her ill repute. The impact of disapproval from her employers and staff alike only reinforced her status as the outsider. The question of money must have always been on Hélène's mind. Each day spent without work meant a step closer to poverty and homelessness. The servant needed to provide her own clothes, which should be clean and in good condition. So buying new clothes, personal bed linen and sanitary necessities causes a major strain on the finance of a lone woman without any kind of financial or family support. One way to improve her circumstances would be gaining a better professional situation. However, her lack of education, her bad behaviour and reputation, either presumed or correct, impaired her repeated attempts. It's an act of self-sabotage which can be witnessed in people suffering from depression and mental health disorders today. You try hard to improve yourself, but when presented with setbacks, you revert to the only things you already know. In Hélène's case, this would be stealing and jealousy. During her stay in the religious community, the nuns suspected Hélène tried to destroy the belongings of the other pensioners, shredding their clothes and books. Her last two victims, Rose Tessier and Rosalie Sarazan, were given responsibility to oversee Hélène because they could read and write. They were younger than her and they had superiority over her within the household. This must have compounded her feelings of anger, especially as she had asked her employer if she could fulfil the role of her first victim to try and earn a better status within the house. So, do we have any evidence for the reason why she was illiterate? We discussed earlier that when she was orphaned, she was sent to a presbytery, a large building run by the church, which often took in waifs and strays to try and improve their situation, while in turn, they learned household chores. The nuns who welcomed her when she lost her job admitted it was extremely difficult to teach her and suggested that maybe Hélène did not have the mental ability to be educated. Again, these descriptions point to a traumatised child having outbursts of uncontrollable emotion. To make matters worse, she was not a native French speaker. Her strong Breton accent was perceived as a lack of intelligence. It's akin today of judging a person's IQ purely based on the stereotypes of a demographic that society has drilled into you. A current example in the USA 
maybe someone that's illiterate from the Appalachian community. Their use of colloquial language and their perceived ignorance may lead closed-minded people to assume that they were not capable of learning or becoming educated to a high level. They are branded a redneck. This negative impact on Hélène's psyche shines through in the signs of depression she displays throughout her life. According to people she encountered, her mood swings oscillated between being openly chatty and then sulking in deep silence. There was also an element of substance abuse, another byproduct of mental health coping mechanisms. Her alcoholism causes her to lose jobs when her employers realize that she's stealing bottles of wine. This reaches a crescendo when her final employer, Mr. Bedard, listed the extent of his losses. Of 40 bottles of Muscat, only five are left. Half of bottles of Malaga are missing. My stock of bottles of red wine was seriously diminished too. Some of the behaviours that Hélène displayed seemed strange to her colleagues. One of the most decried acts is her refusal to sit and eat at the same table as the other servants. Now, this could be seen as a power play. However, Mrs. Robot, an employer, confirms that each time she was visiting the kitchen, Hélène looked like she was hiding something and never had food in front of her. Another employee explains the reason given for not eating with the servants was that Hélène told her she used to vomit frequently because of an unidentified stomach problem. This type of behaviour around meals and food is predominantly found in the mental health condition anorexia nervosa, which is a preoccupation with food and meal preparation. A person with anorexia can easily prepare food for others but not eat the food themselves. An anorexic person can refuse to eat around others and they will be hiding or discarding food they have been presented with. It is a form of control. Some people who suffer with the condition explain that it's a way for them to feel stable and control the one part of their life that they have access to. If this was the case for Hélène, she would feel that food was the only part of her daily routine that she could take command of, as her whole life as a servant was dictated by everyone around her, including society. Being possibly anorexic and suffering from other mental health conditions doesn't mean that she didn't enjoy her handiwork. We must remember that she killed at least 26 people across the years. After poisoning her victims, she would stay around to care for them, bathing in the attention that she received. We can witness this kind of behaviour in modern cases too, such as Kristen Gilbert in 1990s America and Harold Shipman, who killed across almost three decades in the UK. The role of caregiver allowed her to suppress any proof of her crimes while appearing as an angel of mercy. Like so many others, Hélène's overconfidence caused her downfall. After spending so much time undetected, she started to be brash. Her erratic behaviour began to raise suspicions because each employer she worked for lost his or her life, suffered poor health, lost a relative, or was the victim of theft. If an employer warned Hélène of her impending dismissal, somebody in the household would get sick the very same day. At the end of her fated career, living in the house of a lawyer and with doctors attending multiple times, this shows just how confident she was. Knowing that one person had died at her hand, another severely sick, she still went on to kill the third. Luckily for him, the cook's odd behaviour had already made Bedard suspect her involvement, and as a lawyer, her master was quick to act. When it came to the day of the trial, it took only 90 minutes for the jury to come back with their verdict. The death penalty.
The execution takes place on the 26th of February, 1852. As is customary, her body is sent for an autopsy to the Faculty of Medicine. Her skull is used to shape a death mask, which is now displayed in a museum. Hélène Gigardot was no more. In Brittany today, locals remember Hélène Gigardot as a bogeywoman, a figure whose name you call to convince the children to behave. Also, today in Rennes, a cake is made in her name. They use almonds as they were said to mask the bitter taste of arsenic, her weapon of choice. A ballad of 97 verses tells the story of the female poisoner. Films, documentaries and artwork can all be found to this day online. They focus on the macabre acts that she carried out in her short life. Yet, far from being the natural-born killer that Dr Pinot described in his testimony, Hélène Gigardot was alone against the world. She adopted an extreme attitude to survive, devastating entire families in her lonely trail, which led, as they often do, to the cold judgment of the guillotine. A new case is released monthly. Follow our social media for daily clues. <laughs> <laughs>